uh, Mehmet, it's a pleasure to have you. Without any further ado, uh, Mehmet Ross. <coughs> oh, so this mic yeah. you is for the. Thank you very much. This mic with you is for the recording. This okay. mic will be using for the stage. Okay. And this is the clicker. Okay. We'll move forward. And this is the back one. Perfect. I got it. If there is a video, double click. It will play. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. So I'm. Uh, I have been a professor most of my life and I never liked podiums because I never wanted to have distance between myself and the people I was talking to. But my life as an educator has changed quite a bit. I started off lecturing primarily to medical students and then I began speaking more publicly and eventually with a television show, uh, I became someone who was trying to teach people in their own homes. And what I'd like to do today is explain that transition because I think it'll affect many of your lives as well. Many of you will finish this wonderful university. Uh, and again, th thank you, uh, President Mohammed. For, I mean, and Mohammed, uh, where Dr. Z go? He left already. There he is. Dr. Z has been a wonderful uh, colleague educating me about the subtleties of, of what we're seeing in Saudi Arabia. And I'll come back to some of the impressions that I have of this trip. Uh, Vice, uh, Vice President uh, Khalid as well. Thank you for hosting me and guiding me through this process. But the main goal I have today is to make sure that you appreciate a little more how you would speak to your patients and to the public about the things that you care about. And I'll emphasize this because people don't care what you know until they know that you care. So these themes, will, you'll hear them repeated several times during my short presentation. Then I wanted to take some questions from you, if that's okay. Because I think I'll learn more from answering your questions, you probably will as well. So my career started with these devices. Uh, the early mechanical support devices were prepared because we had multiple situations where we didn't have enough donor organs. And I'm a heart surgeon, that's my training. So we'd have patients that were dying, we would do chest compressions on them, they'd wake up, but I didn't have any way of keeping them alive until we had an organ. So the initial mechanical devices were temporary. They were designed for a week, a month, two months. And then we found they actually were doing pretty well and we could change what they were from initial devices that were just pulsating to these types of rotary pumps. And these technologies began to work long enough that we could use them as destination therapy, that we could trust them, that we wouldn't even transplant patients, which means we could begin to help people that were not candidates for transplantation. But as I was doing mechanical devices, I realized the bigger problem was that we had many, many patients, especially older patients, who had problems with their valves that we couldn't fix with traditional open heart surgery. And so I began to work in technologies that could address mitral valve leakage, aortic valve stenosis, technologies that were problematic for that very reason. And mitral valve leakage was very common in heart failure patients. And heart failure, of course, which has remained the leading cause of death uh, in most developed countries around the world, can happen for many causes. But once it happens, you'll often have leakage of the mitral valve. The mitral valve, by the way, is named the mitral valve because of the Pope's hat. The Pope has a hat that has two parts to it. It's called the mitre. So the mitral valve is shaped like that, two parts. And if you can get those two sides to stick together, then you don't have to replace the whole valve. You don't have to even open the chest. It's one stitch to fix the valve. Now, I didn't think of this idea. This idea came from an Italian surgeon, Alfieri. But I traveled to Italy to sit by his side and understand how this crazy idea could actually work. And I emphasized the importance of travel for that reason. I would never have come up with these ideas if I'd stayed in my university uh, building at Columbia and very safely done heart surgery. What I realized over time is traveling the world exposed me to ideas that were important, not because I helped them, but because those ideas would come back to help me. So when I realized we could use one stitch from the groin, I thought we could do this. On the plane ride home from that event where I was with Alfieri, I wrote the patent for this. This is the mitra clip. It's the most common way that we fix mitral valves around the world, percutaneously, again, very sick people. You wouldn't do hernia operations on these patients. 
They can't breathe, they can't lie flat, but you can put a clip from their groin, and if it works, and you notice this is a little more sophisticated than you might think, you have an area that grasps the valve, and then an inner grasper to grasp and bring together the two leaflets of the valve. Like a zipper, once they touch, they shut. So the valve will close by itself. An idea that was so foreign to me, it never dawned on me. But again, this Italian surgeon had the concept. I took it and made it a percutaneous one, and we made it into a business. And this is now, uh, we sold it to Abbott, and now it's sold all over the world. Like the aortic valve device that we also uh, were able to develop, that's now made by Edwards, and again, used all over the world. It was an idea that a medical student had. I was lecturing like this, and a medical student was saying, when you try to do the aortic valve without opening the chest, you're trying to remove the old valve and then put a new one in place of it. Why not leave the old valve? Leave the old valve where it is and just put your new stent valve inside and squish the old valve out of the way. It's brilliant. <laughs> so simple, so simple that a trained heart surgeon would not think of it. Not just me, no trained heart surgeon thought of it. Young people have innovative ideas that they have, they have not yet been indoctrinated, have not yet calcified. There's no right way to do anything because there's not yet that knowledge base. But by allowing young people to speak influentially about how to make things better, you end up with ideas that can change the face of a field. So I encourage you to ask those questions that sometimes you're a little embarrassed because you think that there, you know, if you knew more, you wouldn't ask it. It's the opposite. Because you don't know more, you can ask it. You're not frozen. And I think I speak for all the senior members of the staff here in articulating that and emphasizing it because it's what, it's what makes universities so critical as the lifeblood of any growing culture. And I promised I'd give you some feedback on my thoughts on Saudi Arabia. I came here trying to understand what I would bring to the kingdom. What I'm going to leave with, and I have a few more days still, but after a week here, what I'm going to leave with is the passion and the innovation, but most importantly, the confidence and optimism that you have about the future. That's contagious. Because when you believe you can build a better country, a better world, others want to come with you because they want to experience it. It's that sense of optimism that I'm seeing everywhere, but especially among young people in Saudi Arabia that's contagious. I was at the National Data Center yesterday at the Ministry of Health. The idea that you would have access to that kind of information and be able to use it to improve the quality of life, that you'd have a call center that would allow you to take calls from patients and families or practitioners, doctors, nurses, or from businesses working with government and answer questions. That's the kind of task that a government rarely offers. This morning I was at King Faisal Hospital and they have a similar dashboard that can identify supply chain issues and delays in care. We talk about these things with numbers, but not minute to minute dashboards. The ability to use information like this allows, of course, you to track what's happening, but export it. Bring the ideas here, make them better, and export them outside the country to help others, which I know is part of your passion. But I cannot emphasize enough, as someone who travels the world, my show was in 118 countries. So I travel a lot. There is no way for one country to figure it all out. And we all are defined by the people in our lives. The same happens for countries. So by helping countries very far from here, figure things out that you've already worked out, you'll benefit them and they'll repay the favor in time. So let's talk about patients and people in the public and how to talk to them. I've had a lot of media businesses. One of them, uh, we wrote the U books. They're all translated into Arabic. Now there's a hand pointing at you, but the hand's not accusing you. It's saying, come on, we can do this together. The magazine, which was called The Good Life, and the title of this talk, this, uh, this is a fake cover that I made for this talk, but all these things are important for living the good life. Family, food, faith, fun, all these fit together. If you have an ability to understand what to eat, what to add to your, food, your, your life if you're not eating the right things, how to exercise, how to remain flexible, a little bit about purpose, some idea of what's worked in the past, and of course you have to have faith because you need a bigger structure around you to understand where you belong uh, in, this, in this crazy world, then you end up living the good life. But people get there in different ways. And one way you get there, and this is my personal secret, is passion. 
But each of you has a different little trait. So I'm gonna do a little exercise here. You're going to do this today after the talk. You're going to text three friends. They have to be friends. I'll tell you why in a second. Because you're going to ask them a very important question. What do they like about you and why? That's the question. So if they don't like you, it's not a good question. You ask the question because the answers they give have to be one word answers. Why do they like you? What is it about you that makes you special? We're just meeting each other, but if you ask Mohammed, for example, why he likes me, I hope he does, right? Or everyone, does. everyone thank you very much. <laughs> but you're very kind. But if you're asking people why they like you, they're gonna come up with a word, and the word for me is passion. Because I care a lot. I'm not always understanding everything. I'm not always the smartest person at figuring ideas out, but I care a lot. And I'll go hard to try to figure out the right answer because I have that passion. I tell my children as well, find your word. But whatever that word is, be that word every day. Show up as that word, as that person, because that's what makes you special. Don't be other people because they're already taken. Everyone else is taken. Be yourself, but be it in the context of what people define you as. Now, we're all imperfect. This is me. This is my right side split and my left side split. So you probably didn't notice how asymmetrical I am, and you've probably seen pictures of me. I saw the posters walking in. Each of us have these imperfections. And we have to forgive ourselves for our imperfections, but then build on those imperfections. It's those imperfections that make us special. Now, you all know what a jade stone is, right? The jade. So there's a museum in New York City. There was a movie shot there called Night at the Museum. It's the Natural History Museum. It's a very famous museum. They have beautiful gems. When my children were young, I have four kids, and my son-in-law is here, but my, my oldest daughter married him. And I brought some of the family with me, by the way. They're, they're out sightseeing. But they, uh, they would go to the museum, and I'd ask him, which of the gems do you like? And there was this beautiful, big jade stone, flawless, perfect. Not one of my daughters, including his wife, ever picked it. Why? What makes jade beautiful are its imperfections, its flaws. Think about it, a simple jade stone looks plastic. A jade with gold inlay, with little, I, think, I, I bet across at, at the, uh, uh, where, where King Faisal's home, they probably have imperfect jade stones, on perfect, on purpose. And great houses often do because it's more attractive, it's more interesting. So celebrate your imperfections, forgive them, and then build on them. So the reality is most people don't do that. We do the opposite. We don't move forward. We get stuck in our imperfections. And your audience, your patients, your families, maybe even you, have the same issue. And then you don't change. So if you don't like who you are, and in my case, I'm always talking to audiences about their health. Why don't you act on your diabetes? Why don't you lose the weight that you know you want to get rid of? Why don't you take better care of your skin or pay attention to your intestines? The reason people don't change is broken into four categories, but they're not equally important. Time is a problem, especially uh, if you're busy and you put other things, prioritize other things. Mothers do this. They prioritize their children over their own health. Money is a problem, especially when you have a poorer population, underserved population, sometimes can't afford to make the right decisions. It's more difficult. But I actually don't think those are the two big problems. Number three is a problem, knowledge. I've spent my life trying to fix knowledge, trying to educate and inform. In Saudi Arabia, you have a unique opportunity to fix knowledge as a problem. Because in much of the world, People are trying to figure it out, but we find that rich people figure it out and people without as many uh, uh, re, uh, support can't figure it out. It's more difficult. But knowledge I also don't think is the biggest problem. The biggest problem I've learned is fear of change. You're scared that if you try to change and you can't, that means you're not worthy, that you're not good enough and you'll never be good enough. So part of what I'd love to leave you with is a confidence that you have, that you can change, and if you don't succeed, who cares? More importantly, I want you to pass that on to the people in your life and to the people you're taking care of. They have to feel it's okay if they fail in your eyes. 
And if you can do it yourself, you can do it with them. Now, how do you change? I'm gonna cut down 20 years of working in media to this slide. This is important. <laughs> this is how you change. First, remember, people do, this is uh, one of those realities that is evident once you hear it, but remember it. People fundamentally change their minds based on emotion. They don't change based on facts. Facts are not enough. Don't throw 100 numbers at people. Why do they care? On the show, I would tell stories of people that were struggling with health so that viewers could see those people and say, I'm like that person. And if that person can change, I can change as well. Second, you have to make it easy to do the right thing. If it's hard to, to eat the right breakfast, you're gonna eat the wrong breakfast. So whether you automate your life with pre prepared foods you know are better for you or you skip breakfast, which is what I try to do, you know, intermittent fast a little, whatever you do, it's fine, but make it easy to do it. Because if it's hard, if it's homework, it won't get done. Adore your solutions, and if you do that, you'll be aiming at what you want your life to be, which is the good life. So know what that is. Define the good life so you can start living it. To do that, you need two things that are important. You need connection. I touched on this earlier, but we really are defined by the people in our lives. Who are those people? You have to stay connected. We have an epidemic now, not just in the United States, but I learned visiting the Ministry of Health twice this week, that loneliness is probably the biggest epidemic here as well. We have to address loneliness and having connection with your families, your friends, you're in this auditorium, we're forming a connection, it matters. Don't ignore that. And the second is gratitude. Understanding why things are working out the way they were, that's a bigger purpose, and feeling grateful for the fact that you're on this journey. If you can do those two things, maintain connection and have gratitude, you're halfway to the good life. So these are the medical issues that I would focus on. I just touched on the spiritual ones, emotional ones. These are the medical ones. There's five life adjustments that drive 70% of how we age. Now this is a fascinating bit of study. My partner writing the U books, you the owner's manual we wrote them calling it that because the only thing in the world you buy or get that doesn't have an owner's manual is you so you have to have an owner's manual we wrote one and we wrote eight of these books and they were all new york times bestsellers and the reason they succeeded is because we made things accessible and mike Royzen, my partner had come up with a concept called real age real age based on thirty thousand clinical studies is a hundred survey test. You can take it, it's free. It's a test that accesses how old your body thinks you are. Not how old you really are, how old does your body think you are? And the real age test gives us lots of information about you that we can use to help you. But we learned from it that there are five factors that drive 70% of aging. Daily blood pressure should be measured if you're especially over the age of 40, 45. It should be optimally 115 over 75. Remember, high blood pressure is 140 over 90. How many of you are in the medical tract? Oh, good, perfect. So, med hypertension we treat as uh, 140 over 90, but treating it with medication is not as good as doing it by yourself. And 130 over 85 is not as good as the optimal blood pressure, 115 over 75. That's where people should be headed. That's where they'll stay most of their life if they're managing the, the, the various factors that determine it. Exercising 30 minutes a day, a healthy diet that you love. I'll come back to that in a second. Stress control and sleep, especially sleep, is the most underappreciated opportunity throughout the world. Most folks have trouble with sleep after the age of 50, and it leads to premature aging, shortening of telomeres, and a slew of other defects that you don't want to live. And finally, you have to deal with the addictions in your life. And addictions can be food, they can be cigarettes, they can be many factors. So let's start off with heart disease. I've had many celebrities on my show. One well-known woman had a heart attack, and she came on the show to talk about it, and I made a video explaining how a heart attack happens. So this is Rosie, and she'll rotate now. Oh, what happened to my video? Well, it's not gonna play. Oh, there it is, it did play. All right, so if you just turn it to the side and go inside, there's the LAD, left anterior descending artery of the heart, the main artery of the heart. And inside that artery, there's blood coursing. Right now, all of you have the same phenomenon. That plaque can build up over days, even hours, it ruptures, and once it, it's tearing, boom! Once the plaque ruptures, you have a raw surface. The body forms a clot on any raw surface. That clot closes off the artery suddenly, so suddenly that all of a sudden, the blood flow to that part of the heart goes away, like, like a punch. A bruise starts to form on that part of the heart, and when that occurs, the heart begins to quiver, it will often stop. 
This is unfortunately what we see during acute myocardial infarctions. Now in the kingdom, I saw this at the Ministry of Health, there's a very good uh, pathway to get people rapidly into the cath lab or to getting a needle to open up that artery. But if you don't open that within 60 minutes, you start to see significant damage. And within four to six hours, you've had most of the damage already. So the ability to treat this quickly works. But go back to that plaque. Why did that plaque rupture? The plaque ruptures because it's an unstable plaque. It's unstable because usually food that's been eaten of the wrong kind, saturated fats in particular, uh, or folks who have problems with metabolic syndrome, they'll begin to form soft plaque that's not very rigid. It's like a hole. If I punch a hole in that wall behind me, how do I fix the hole? I have to use plaster. If I use the right kind of plaster to fix the hole, I get a very nice re repair. It looks just like it did before there was an injury. But if I use cheap material, the plaster doesn't stay well. It falls out. It begins to crack like you saw, and that leads to heart attacks. That tactic of showing videos to people so they, in their heart, believe what's happening to their heart was incredibly effective for us and really helped us dramatically change the impact of what we are saying to the audience in, all, in many countries around the world where they didn't understand the control they have. Because if a heart attack happens in hours, that means what you had for breakfast today can change your chance of having a heart attack tomorrow, which is true, by the way. You have that much control over your future, so therefore you can take advantage of it and begin to act that way. Now, the other tactic that I used quite reliably was not dumbing things down, but showing the real impact of what you're doing. These are lungs. Lungs are beautiful pink sponges soaking up oxygen. The blood's coursing through them. An elegant gift from God. Now if you smoke, it looks like this. The tar deposition is evident. At the very top of this lung, there's some moth-eaten area, some holes. That's called emphysema. And so when the, the lay public, an average patient, sees this and they're smoking, there's no way for them to look away. It's pretty evident that there's a problem here that they need to address. And by allowing them to see it the way you see it, you'll help your patients feel as passionate as you do about fixing the problem. And let me go to the issue of waste, because talking about weight is really a challenge because people are so resistant, because they feel so ashamed that they haven't been able to lose the weight. So I don't talk about weight, because frankly, weight doesn't matter. What matters is waist size, right? How big your waist is. Now you want your waist to be less than one half of your height. Ideally, that's the number you want to remember. Waist less than one half of the height. This is, formula works for children as well. Because you never want to talk to young people about weight uh, because they'll get focused on it and they'll do wrong things to lose weight. Focusing, focusing on waste allows a more gradual move in the right direction with the right incentives. So we keep this as the goal. Now how do you do it? How do you actually make that come to life? Well, this is the, the best way for me to explain it. That's the yellow pad is the omentum. Get rid of that. The liver is the top left. Gallbladder is the green. The food in your stomach, many of you just eat, ate. The food in your stomach is coming into the duodenum, second part of the intestinal tract, and the nutrients begin to get absorbed through the wall up with the gallbladder. That green is the gallbladder. Fluid mixing with it. The bile allows the food to be digested like soap washing and a stain. It gets absorbed through the portal vein, the big vein driving into the liver, the door to the liver. Once these nutrients come to the liver, it either allows the liver to have nutrients to make the proteins you need, or it causes a fatty liver. What you're seeing right here is a problem that afflicts about a quarter of people in the United States and in po populations with obesity, like Saudi Arabia, it's quite high as well. And then you see the sequelae, that yellow pad of fat, the omentum stretching way across the stage as you begin to build up more and more toxic material that poisons your liver more and more. The reason obesity is so important is it probably drives a quarter of the health budget. If we deal with obesity in Saudi Arabia, United States, Western Europe, even now China, if you deal with obesity in these countries, you dramatically change the amount of money that's available for general health care. And this also emphasizes the reality that we need prevention as our primary care tool, not treatment. I can operate on the consequences of obesity. I can do heart surgery. But the money is much better spent preventing the obesity, plus you make the patient happier. That's why I'm actually optimistic about some of the new injections that have come out, the GLP-1 agonist drugs, semaglutide and others. 
that are effectively helping people to lose this fat. But we have to use these tools sparingly and we have to build around these tools systems that allow people to move towards losing weight so that when you stop the drugs, they can keep their weight down by themselves. You're going to be part of the revolution that changes the number of people struggling with obesity. And by doing that, you'll free up a lot of money so we can invest in new technologies to improve the aging and other problems. Now, conventional diets here and elsewhere are always based on willpower. Willpower is like holding your breath underwater. How many of you can hold your breath indefinitely underwater? How many can hold your breath forever? It's impossible. There's a dozen redundant systems in your body to remind you, to remind you to take deep breaths. Just like dieting, it doesn't work. We can medically change it with bypass surgery and balloons and medications, but biology will always beat willpower, always. So don't try to force the biology. Instead, alter the biology. And in medicine, we're beginning to be able to do that. Or alter the goal, your choice. And the people you're helping need to make that decision as well. Here's, a, here's how I talk about it. Do we have an audio for this? So I would make these for social media and they become very popular because they come along with a plan. Simple things you could do. Intermittent fasting, which I mentioned, is an example of one. I'd advocate for a Mediterranean diet. Programs I thought were sustainable. So if you can do it for two weeks and change your habits, you'd begin to think, hey, I can do this. Walking was the most effective tool because you can do it every day, you won't hurt yourself, and it's sort of fun. And then after you get used to walking every day, you start to meditate when you walk. You begin to listen to music or uh, podcasts or whatever you want to do, but it takes you away from food and gives you confidence you can do it, which is why physical fitness is such a valuable tool. This, unfortunately, is the problem, right? When you eat or drink empty calories, your brain very smartly says, I got sugar, but I didn't actually get nutrients. And the brain is looking for nutrients. It's not looking for sugar. That's why nuts, fascinatingly, are much better for weight loss. Now nuts have lots of calories, and we have lots of nuts in the kingdom, but nuts have nutrients too. They're the eggs of trees. And so you give nutrients to the brain, the brain says, stop, stop eating, you did enough. And so if the brain gets the right message, it won't force you to eat. That's why I don't like artificial sweeteners. Because regular sugar in a little packet, it's 16 calories. You know, that's not the problem, 16 calories. The problem is when you have teaspoonfuls of sugar in soda pop, one is one per ounce and you don't realize it. And you don't appreciate the impact that it's having on you. You still keep eating as much at the meal as you would have without the soft drink. And these kinds of lessons, which you know, are not widely appreciated by the public. Why not? We haven't given them the message. It's our job to give them that message. That's what I'm hoping to do with Dr. Mohammed and others to emulate what you're learning here. Give people in the kingdom the knowledge that you have, the important parts, the most critical elements, and they'll do the same thing you do. Act on the knowledge. People are smart. Teach them, they'll learn, and they'll act on what they're learning. We have a kids foundation, which I'll, I'll, I'll show it in a second, but that does this. It's, it focuses on teaching kids because they'll teach their parents. Uh, the other thing I want to emphasize is muscle. There is no substitute for building muscle. If you really want to have sustained weight loss, Build enough muscle because muscle burns more calories than fat. But you'll never lose weight by building muscle. So lose weight with diet, maintain the weight loss with exercise. And if your patients understand that and your family and you, then it changes expectations. Otherwise you work out, you don't lose weight, you get upset about the process. This is the goal. Imagine that you're in the wilds. 
This leopard chasing its prey, hapless, not much the prey can do. The animal, this leopard is much faster, but watch, we can run full speed too. When was the last time you did this? Have run full speed. Most of us never go full speed once we reach adulthood. Kids do it all the time. But when you work out, if you can, while you're working out, periodically go at full speed. Let's say one out of every 10 minutes, go at full speed. It's been demonstrated to be effective as increasing the impact of the exercise. In fact, you're better off going for 10 minutes as fast as you can than an hour slowly meandering if you're going to work out. Get your heart rate up. All the data we have shows that being the most important predictor of exercise helping. And there's an area of the, uh, that's called the blue zones. How many of you have heard of blue zones? Oh, I love this. Almost nobody. How do you know about blue zones? Now she's shy. <laughs> All right. The blue zones are places, so ethnographers, when they go around the world looking where people live the longest, they put little lines around them. So the red areas, they live the shortest. But the blue zones live the longest. And in parts of the world, they really live a long time. So Okinawa in Japan, they live a long time, probably because they eat smaller meals. But they get sunlight, and the water has calcium in it, so their bones stay strong. And they have connection to each other, and they have a faith. So does Sardinia, same thing. Sardinia, they have to climb the mountain all the time. Lots of sunlight. They have cheese and, with, and milk with calcium in it, so they can keep, keep their strength. They have connection, they have faith. Uh, in in uh, Costa Rica, same thing. Loma Linda in the United States is where the, there's a very uh, famous group of Christians called Seventh-day Adventists. They're, they live their lives based on their faith. They live a long time. We believe there might be a blue zone in southern Saudi Arabia. Some of the mountainous areas where people seem to live a long time. We're going to study that later this year. But these are the kinds of insights. If you know what's really working for longevity, use it. And there's a council now in the Ministry of Health on longevity, an, op an opportunity for Saudi Arabia to establish what really works for longevity. And it's wonderful to have the tools, but this is part of it, being able to go full speed. But this is the alternative. This is a real gym in America, in Los Angeles. You notice it's a gym and there's an escalator. And people are taking the escalator into the gym. What the Blue Zones teach us is that you can't just do it for 10 minutes or an hour a day. You have to live a day, a, a life that every day has activity. Those Blue Zones had one really important overlapping reality, daily rigorous activity. Every day you stay busy working hard at the things you love. That's how you live a long time. The chance of living to age 100 in these Blue Zones is four times higher than if you live in most parts of the Western world. That's even with good health care. Health Corps is our kids' foundation that I touched on briefly. We touched, we've raised $80 million for this foundation. Uh, we spent uh, a, a lot of time uh, trying to under, get kids to, to learn about nutrition, get them to have better fitness habits, and get mental resilience, get tough, so they can deal with the challenges of life. We've touched the lives of about three million children with this program. Uh, we actually yesterday met with, uh, with uh, the leader of a major foundation here. Uh, we have hope that we can exchange ideas. Uh, and I'm hoping we can bring Health Corps to Saudi Arabia because we rely on young students like you going back into high schools to teach teenagers about health, wellness, and resilience. Like the Peace Corps. It's a program that, that's based on the energy of young people being spread as mentors to people who are teen years. And these mentors, that woman on the left is one of them, would like you, would go into schools and show organs, show videos, but also answer questions about issues that are plaguing young people and ways they might be able to do a better job because you know, because you did it. You cope with problems like they're coping with problems and you're close in age to them. And for that reason, you're more likely to be able to help them and they're more likely to listen to you because they're like a little brother or sister to you and that's a better relationship than a professor talking to them where it's a very distant, far away relationship. Second opinions, I'm gonna just show one slide on this. I wrote a book on this once that uh, amazingly was a bestseller because so many patients didn't know it. But second opinions are essential. And I tell this because only 10% of patients get them and you have to emphasize to your patients to go get second opinions because one third of the time it'll change the diagnosis and it'll help doctors learn. To do it, you need digital support systems. 
So I was talking with this yesterday with the Ministry of Health. I think second opinions can be a standard way of improving the quality of care. If you're getting cancer therapy and you get a second opinion and the two oncologists have different opinions of how to treat your cancer because one has a genomic assessment of your cancer and the other doesn't, you know where to go. But the person not doing the genomic testing uh, should not be treating cancer without it, I don't think. And I had this discussion this morning at the King Faisal Hospital, and I think it's standard of care here as well, but it's not done all the time. And the fact that not every cancer patient is having a precision approach to their cancer is a failure of the system, but not of individual doctors necessarily, but of the system. To fix it, we've created all kinds of tools, uh, like AskMD, which is an app that we have in America. You have apps that are very sophisticated here. We're hoping to exchange ideas to figure out how to do a better job. But we have technology, AI-based, of helping people diagnose themselves. So it's an effective second opinion. So if you're not going to see a doctor, at least get a digital second opinion to see if the treatment that's being offered to you makes sense. It'll give you more confidence, but it makes the doctors better as well. Now, and let me show you one. I only have one data slide but I wanted to show this to you. So look at the if displaying cost effectiveness is, is a tactic that people talk about but don't do much. I actually generated a way of analysis, uh, uh, analyzing it based on the effects of a quality adjusted life years. Quality is quality adjusted life years. So the well, X axis is how effective it is in making you live longer with the quality of life. The Y axis is cost. And I bring this up because although you may not think about money in day-to-day -day practice, Money drives the system, so we all need to be respectful of make, making sure it's spent the right way. So, with this in mind, if you look at, well, sorry, uh, a cost-effective uh, ratio, you do a little sensitivity analysis in there. Now remember, if you're in the bottom left, if it's less costly and less effective, well, you're not sure if you want to use it, right? Maybe it's worth it, maybe it's not. Same if it's more costly, more effective. Obviously, if it's more costly and doesn't work, just say no. And if it's a great deal, doesn't cost much, but it's more effective, say yes, that's obvious. But the decisions that we have to make as practitioners are usually the top right corner. So what goes on here? You have $20 per quality of life year opportunities, and you have $100 quality of, of, of life year opportunities. And we as a society have to decide which therapies are gonna be worth doing in that space. This is the hard part of leading medical innovation. And as someone who spent my life patenting and innovating and advancing technologies, I spent a lot of my time seeing if I can move from $100,000 per year of life lived down to $20,000. If I can get it down, it's worth it for everybody. If I can't, I don't want to pursue it because it's not serving society. It just creates problems because society has a difficult time addressing that. For example, end of life care, which is a problem everywhere in the world. How much is worth spending at the end of life? We have to be disciplined, at least understanding where those costs are being driven. So let me give you a concrete example, a place where we should spend more money, sleep. It drives growth hormone production, right? It's massively important for quality of work that's being performed by employees. Companies want their employees working better. We should be helping them. And yet the systems that we offer people for sleep are very primitive, even here in the kingdom. But what works, there's some simple ideas. And I'm very interested in alternative medicine. I personally take vitamins and supplements. I think they help me, but many of them are unproven. So what does seem to work? Well, some natural remedies work. Melatonin, my father is, my, I'm of Turkish origin, Mehmet. Uh, my father uh, went to the United States to Western Reserve. I saw one of your graduates is uh, matched there. It's a wonderful institution. Um, and my dad matched there, but he grew up on a tart cherry farm. They all slept well. <laughs> mainly because they're working hard. But tart cherry has melatonin in it. So you can take the tart cherry or a small amount of melatonin. Pajamas that are loose that don't restrain you are important. Ambient noise, that's why cities are difficult for people to sleep in, but you have to address it. Sound machines, earplugs, find a way of doing it. The coldest room that's tolerable, 65 Fahrenheit, I don't know what the centigrade is, but it's cold. You should see your breath a little bit. It's better for sleeping. Uh, and deal with the stress in your life. And remember, stress is two kinds. There's some stress that makes you work better, but there's also some stress that makes you hostile. Hostility is driving here from my hotel and getting cut off in traffic and getting angry at the person for being sloppy in their driving. That's normal. It's stressful, but it's okay. Wishing they would die, that's hostility. <laughs> right? That doesn't help anybody. 
And that's what often happens as people go through their lives. This doesn't work either. Face the stresses in your life, and people in your life are gonna trust you to do just that. But many of your patients will do this. And our job in the medical profession is to get people to feel confident enough that they, be, they can become world experts on their bodies. If you're on the right program for change, the real secret is to automate. And when you automate, you're not gonna know that you're on a program. It becomes your routine. You don't even think about it. Take the same pills every morning, do the same exercise routine, eat the same foods, at least in the morning. By the afternoon, you can play around. But you wanna forget you're on the program and give it two weeks. If it doesn't work in two weeks, it's probably not the right program for you. Now, I added a slide last night that's just for you. And I did it because I, I, I know you're young and you're thinking about your careers. And I wanted to teach you something that I was taught. Many years ago, when I was, at, uh, I used, I was a member of a group at the, at the World Economic Forum that would bring leaders and talk to us. And uh, one of these leaders gave me this slide. So the vertical is happiness, the horizontal is time. And this is a very important curve. It's a philosophical curve. You're on this curve right now. I don't know where you are, but you're on this curve. The, the uh, white line is the line of life. You're born. Now, your childhood sometimes can be difficult, right? You have dirty diaper, parents don't listen, you're unhappy with your pimples. The white line goes up, and then you figure out life. You get into medical school or graduate school, you get to, you, you're accepted to King Faisal University, and life goes really, really good. And then you graduate from here, and you begin to have some problems. You'll always have problems. Relationships, a job you don't like, uh, money, there's problems that happen. Then, you'll start to figure things out. And when you start to move up the curve, you get to point A. You see point A? Life is good in point A, right? You're getting a good job, good relationships, uh, you're figuring out your faith, life's going well. Then you get to point B. Point B, you're the best you're ever going to be. How many here think they're the best they're ever gonna be? No, today, you gotta do better than today, good. Most of you know you have a big, bright future in front of you. But one day, you'll be at B. And then slowly, you'll sink down to C. This is the life story of all of us. But here's the lesson. The lesson is the blue curve. You have to change your lives when you get to the right point. But what is the right point? Most people change their lives at point B, right? The best you're ever gonna be, it's time to go to the next level. The problem, is if you change your life at point B, what's your direction, your acceleration, your vector? It's horizontal, you're not going up anymore. The time to change your life is point A. The time to change your life is when you're maximally accelerating because the new curve will jettison you higher, push you higher than you ever could have gone on your own. It's scary to change at point A. You don't wanna change when things are going well but you have to. You have to find it in your heart, have the confidence, and know that you've done everything you can to fix the field you're in, and although you can keep doing it for a while, you wanna see the next opportunity to help people, the next place where you can play a role that, that, that uses your talents to the best way possible. And this lesson that he shared with me, and there are many other people in the room, just coincidentally, who are very well known now, we all tried to follow this. Try to find the opportunity in point A to jump beyond where point B could have ever been. If you do it, you go higher, and then higher, and higher, and that's your goal. And I'll show you the last two slides. Your heart needs a reason to keep beating. Find it. Find what you love the most and make sure it comes true. If you do that, then you'll have the confidence because we can do it. You're worth it. So God bless you very much. Thanks for having me. I, I, uh, I don't know what time it is, but we have time for one or two questions? Or? Yes, so I was going to say thank you so much for that insightful talk on healthy living. I think we could all use a little bit of uh, inspiration on leading healthier lives. Uh, if we could spend just a couple of minutes, that would be fantastic. Okay, thank you. So I'll take two questions. That way I can get you. I know you have classes. Is, is it one o'clock yet? Oh. Oh, perfect. Then we'll take as many questions as we can. All right, questions. Yes, in the back. Yell. Be loud. Oh, oh, there's a mic here. She's walking down the stairs. And who's next? So after, you're next, okay.
Do you, do you think that is something that is a solution for the situation that we're in as far as health care, directing everything towards lifestyle medicine? It's essential. Yeah, the mic can go here. The gentleman here has it. The, uh, don't leave. I'm, I'm going to give you. It's essential to have lifestyle medicine uh, that is respected within medicine. Part of the challenges for, with preventive medicine and approaches to lifestyle, and I was with the uh, Quality of Life uh, group yesterday. Uh, they, they're fantastic. Uh, uh, His Excellency Albada runs that. And I was learning a lot about how lifestyle is being uh, um, spread through the different ministries. And I think Saudi Arabia is ahead of the world on this trajectory. But it is critical that we understand what drives the improvement of lifestyle. So how we put our city walks in. I, you know, my friend, uh, Jerry Inzarello, I, for many, many years, is a famous, famous uh, hotel person. And he is in charge of the Deria project. And Deria is a good example of this. They're building cities where you want to bike by building long bike paths. You want to walk because they make it easy to walk. They put a, a, a road that is the size of the Champs-Élysées in Paris because you'll want to walk on that road. Uh, they make it easy to get the right foods. Uh, they have a sort of a, a it's clean. You to remove toxins so that your environment is, 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 uh, is going to conduce, be conducive to the right lifestyle. So I think all of these are part of the solutions that in the 21st century we have to build on. It's not just a matter of cleaning up the environment. It's also a matter of making it proactively possible for people to live their best life. And that will reduce a lot of the illnesses that take away the funding that we need to, re to reinvest in the society. Yes, sir. Hi, Dr. Ross. So good to see you in person. I you might know I came across your pathology specimens while you're training at Columbia University. So it's fine to see you in person. So my question to you is that there are changes that AI is bringing to medicine. How can a physician equip themselves to change the data? AI, very good question. Thank you for it. Who's the next question, by the way? So we can get the bike to you. All right, just, just right there. All right, so let's talk about AI for a second. The thing that surprised me when I first started learning about AI, and I have a friend who works at Google in the group that actually did a lot of their early development work. So he's been talking about AI for six, seven years. And I began to understand how it works, not that I could do it myself, but understand the principles. And the, the biggest challenge is we don't really know why it's able to get so smart so quickly. But we do know that how you educate the AI platforms dramatically impact their accuracy and utility. People in AI don't know medicine. They're intimidated by medicine. Now there are some exceptions. Pathology, radiology, where it's standard pattern recognition, the AI gurus, they get that because they can recognize patterns of spending with your credit card and many other you know, television watching habits. Those are numbers. But the detailed, empathetic caring of human beings is going to require that we get involved. So if doctors aren't in the room when these discussions are happening, they will not be done right. I believe AI is going to play a role in medicine, not by medical information being taken to AI centers, but by AI technology being embedded in health centers. So the hospitals, the Ministry of Health, that's where AI should evolve. The technology already is fairly impressive. AI can pass medical board examinations. Maybe do better than you. Maybe have a better fund of knowledge. But the future, I think, will be patients calling your, your office. A AI bot of you will answer and have the initial discussion. Actually, in the trials that have been done so far, patient satisfaction is higher with AI than doctors. Because the hundredth time you answer a question about diabetes, you're not so excited about it. Whereas the AI can be excited every time. It remembers everything about you, the patient, because it's AI. And then they give you all the information correctly, hopefully, but the doctor, the real doctor, then comes in and polishes it, makes it better. It saves you time, saves money, gives better quality care. That's the right way to use it. If we're not in the room, it's not going to develop in a way that will help our patients. And we definitely don't want money driving the AI systems. We want quality of care and improved care driving the systems. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for this wonderful presentation. I have a conversation about it for being a student. Uh, I know this question might not be related to the 
If you can share with us uh, an advice about leadership for future positions, especially in the field, uh, when you deal with different people from different backgrounds and uh, different nationalities, ethnicities, and all these things. Thank you very much. What's your, what's your first name? Uh, Abdul Ahmad. Okay. Abdul Rahman. Abdul Rahman. Good. Okay. The, so Abdul Rahman, you're asking a question that most doctors don't ask, but we all should be asking. And leadership comes in many different forms. But I'll tell you, I became a much better leader after I started my show. I, I ran the Heart Institute. Uh, I was captain of my teams playing sports. I won the captain's award at Harvard. So I've always thought that I could lead. But to be a real leader, I think, you have to learn to listen. And on the show, although it's called a talk show, <coughs> you're actually not talking. You're listening. You have to hear what people are saying. Doctors notoriously don't listen. We say we do, but we're always the smartest one in the room. That's how we got into medical school. So we think we're always the smartest person in the room. So when people are telling us better ways of doing things, we think, come on, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I know how to do it better than you. When the patient's telling us exactly what's wrong with them, and we don't listen, and don't hear them, and then after 10 tests we tell them what they knew, we're not being leaders. But especially when it comes to society. Society today, more than ever, needs and craves leaders in the medical profession. The number one most respected field is nursing. Nursing. Doctors are behind, but we're not that far behind. And we'll probably never catch up because nurses are unique, but we can at least try to catch up. But to be leaders, we have to actually step out of the safety of our white uh, surgical gowns and scrubs and, and you know, the, the, the ivory tower of safety of wonderful institutions like this. And we have to go lead in society. I'll leave you with one insight. We have, I believe, four things we have to do as professionals. This is not just for doctors. It's for lawyers, it's for engineers, chemists, everything. But it, it's true because if a professional does these things, they will be able to make society the best it can be. The first responsibility we have is to always take care of our client like they're the most important thing in the world. That's the oath we take when we finish medical school, the Hippocratic Oath in the United States. But there's an oath in every medical system that promise to take care of patients. Number two, you want to build on the shoulders of each other. Whatever Vice President Khalid has learned, he's going to teach you, and you have to take it and take it to a higher level. You're not being taught this, so you just take it to this level he was at. You want to leave him behind and make it better. Take what I have tried to teach you and make it better than what I could teach you, and that will actually be your second job. Your third job as a, as a professional is to police each other. Not all doctors are good. And when bad things are happening, when you have a concern, you have to step up. AI is not perfectly good. AI has major concerns. People who are experts in AI need to step forward as they are and say, wait a minute, this is not going the right speed. We have to be smart about this because no one else can do it but us. And the fourth, and this is important to the leadership question, the fourth responsibility we have is, to, is a civic responsibility to step out and lead. Too many times doctors have stepped back Historically, in our communities, our villages, doctors were always in the tent making the big decisions. Doctors were always considered healers, the, the nurses, the other, the, the shamans. They were always healers. They were in the tent, helping make the wise decisions for the community, for the village. Doctors today have to do the same thing in the 21st century. And in Saudi Arabia, I believe, and I've met many clinical leaders who are trying to do that, but we need more. So volunteer your time, show up in your life, and show up in other people's lives. God bless you very much, and thank you very much, President Muhammad. Thank you so much, Dr. Oz. I would actually like to take this moment to welcome to the stage uh, His oh. Excellency uh, Professor Mohammed Al-Hayaza, uh, Professor Khad Al-Qattan, and Professor Mohammed Al-Zamakhshari for a small gift and a photo oh. to commemorate this uh, wondrous occasion. Thank you. Is it, is it a cash prize? <laughs> is it money? More than money. That's right. It's more than money. <laughs> thank you, Professor Ross. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ross. Uh, actually, we are delighted to have you at Al Faisal University. 
Professor Az was asking me in my office, what's your specialty? I told him, chemistry. And chemistry is life. And he's talking about good life. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. OK, this is the slogan of Al Faisal University, which is. Hey, what's it? Give the mic back yeah. here. Or, I want you all to hear this. OK. Yeah. That's from uh, that's the slogan of Al Faisal University from King the late King Faisal to raise the youth it's based in three pillars knowledge faith knowledge and performance so we are delighted to this token of appreciation for your visit to Al Faisal University thank you again thank you very much okay you just hold it together here all right <laughs>